Welcome back to my disembodied voice. In today's video, we're getting clinical again and looking at a rather unstable lady who has a very dark obsession with hit girl herself, Greta. Released in 2018, the movie chronicles Chloe Grace Moretz's likeable loser Francis getting entangled with Isabella Huppert's psychotic Greta and details how one good deed can lead to a world of hurt. Written by Ray Wright and Neil Jordan and directed by Jordan himself, the film was released to mixed reviews and did okay but definitely not spectacular box office numbers. I watched it a few years back on demand and found it a mixed bag with some moments of promise and horror but an overall lack of tension as the film paced towards its climax. Anyway, Greta is a complex character so let's delve into her psychology, look at some possible diagnoses and also discuss what tipped her over the edge from being an abusive mother to a full-on stalker, kidnapper, killer. Now, in today's video, we're going to be discussing stalking, domestic abuse, mutilation, kidnapping, murder and psychosis. So if any of those words are triggers, then this is your only and final warning. Anyway, let's crack on. Before we can dissect Greta in depth, we need to address something called the multi-axial system. Now, let me explain. In the DSM, or the Diagnostic Statistics Manual, the multi-axial model is a system where different symptoms are collectively treated as potential puzzle pieces of a larger, all-inclusive picture that represents an overarching mental disorder. This is the original multi-axial model from the DSM-4 edition and, for context, I'm not going into Axis 5, which is the Global Assessment of Functioning, as this is a more complex scoring chart and this video is about basic understanding rather than trying to put you through a psychology degree. Now, as the DSM-5 has combined Axis 1, two and three into a single branch for diagnosis. I am aware this is an older model, but as this is what I studied and have used for many years, I want to use this one and use it in our discussion as I feel it has a lot of benefit. So starting from the outside, we have axis four, which is psychosocial stressors. Now these can be losing a job or the death of a loved one. And these things are considered analogous to infectious agents. Then we come to axis three, which is general medical conditions such as diabetes, heart concerns, and these can play a part in the overall model. In the diagram, they are lumped together, but in the earlier days, they were separate entities. Before we come to axis two, which is personality disorders. Now this is classified as the mental immune system. And then finally, we come to the core where we have axis one, which are mental health conditions such as depression, anxiety and schizophrenia, which are analogous to catching a flu or a virus. The multi-axial model is a clever little thing as it treats mental health the same way something would affect physical health. So for axis four, we look at real life stressors as if they are pathogens and agents such as germs. And just like in real life, sometimes we have a strong immune system and don't develop illnesses even though we catch the germs. So for some people, severe social stressors can bring someone to a mental collapse where others can cope and hurdle them with ease based on the constructs of their personality. So in this model, our immune system is our personality. Now, not wanting to do a whole video about coping via personality constructs, our personalities are how we act, interact, interface and cope with what life throws at us. Everyone starts with a blank slate when they are born and through parenting and experiences in the world, our personalities are formed via learning and skills within our own phenomenal field of reality. Basically, if someone has issues with, I don't know, perfectionism, and we'll come to this later with Greta's real and now deceased daughter, you develop into one of four types that either gives you a normal personality or a severely disordered one. And this again is how you can cope with things when they're thrown at you. So our four subsections of access to are adaptive, subclinical, disordered, and severely disordered. 
So let's stay with perfectionism. One might develop some obsessive compulsive traits, and this can be a good thing at times because it helps you focus and keeps you going through a task and make sure it's done correctly. It can mean you always do a good job, never give up, or your essays are really good quality because you've spent a long time on them. So how would that fit under our four sections? Okay, number one, adaptive. I take pride in what I do. My essays are good and will not be handed in until I am happy. This is beneficial to the individual. Subclinical. I feel I have to work on things until I get them right. Okay, we have the start of pathology, but you can still finish your essay and get it handed in. Disordered. I can't stop working on something until it's perfect, even if it already satisfies what I need it for. Now we're developing an obsessive compulsive personality. And rather than taking pride, you are inverting your perfectionism and harming yourself by attacking your self-esteem. And you may not finish your essay now because you feel whatever you do, it's not going to be good enough. Number four, severely disordered. Because nothing is ever good enough, I never finish anything. Your essay won't get handed in even though it's probably good enough because you are obsessive to the point of self-sabotage. So our personalities act as our immune system and with a stable personality, you are less likely to develop an illness such as anxiety, depression, or be susceptible to the very biological problems of extremes like bipolar and schizophrenia. Now that's not to say if your personality is stable, you would not suffer from something like schizophrenia as that is from a more biological deficit, but with a strong personality and strong coping mechanisms, the impact of those illnesses may be less severe. Now, axis three is medical conditions, and this can affect things even more. If you have a severe heart condition, like myself, you may not be able to do things normally, or there may have been damage to the brain when younger through oxygen deprivation, or if you have asthma and can't go clubbing with everyone else, take part in sports days, or lead a normal life, your self-esteem can be impacted massively. And let's not forget that many illnesses, such as schizophrenia and bipolar, are biologically based from issues within the brain where too much dopamine can be produced. So axis four, three, and two can all contribute towards the final diagnosis. For Greta, her daughter committed suicide after repeated abuse at home and demands of perfectionism. Greta's daughter was homeschooled, disciplined physically, and even locked in a box when she disobeyed her mother. Since then, Greta has been leading young women to her house via leaving handbags on public transport and trying to replace her daughter with a drugged variant which she will continue to brutalise. Now, it's no coincidence that Greta is called Greta because it's very reminiscent of Gretel from the story Hansel and Gretel, where children are lured to a gingerbread house and then, after gorging themselves on the freebies and sweets, are killed and eaten by the witch. However, back to Greta and our first spike on the multi-axial model is axis four, which is our psychosocial stressors. Greta's daughter killed herself. So despite the abuse, we have massive social stressors of losing a child. Greta has never come to terms with this and unable to accept that she is to blame for this because of her cruelty, the infectious agent is now present. However, Greta is deeply delusional, sadistic, cruel, and most of all, psychotic. So on axis three, do we have a biological deficit in her brain, which means she was always delusional? Greta homeschooled her daughter and both mentally and physically abused her. So is her parenting down to a biological brain defect or are we purely in the territory of axis two, personality disorders? Yes, Greta is sadistic, but she wouldn't qualify for a disorder of sadistic personality disorder due to the fact that her actions are all about recreating a lost moment in time. She is stuck in the place before her daughter died and, as with many people who cannot get over stressful events, she is reliving it time and time again and recreating it by kidnapping a child and making them into a facsimile of her daughter and trying to bond with them despite being cruel and emotionally detached. Greta more than likely has emotionally unstable personality disorder or borderline personality disorder as it used to be known. It was once called borderline personality disorder because it bordered quite literally between the neurotic and the psychotic. However, we're sticking with the new term emotionally unstable personality disorder. So what is emotionally unstable 
personality disorder. Now, let's remember what Theodore Millen once said about personality. Personality disorders, they should not be understood as mental illness, but as styles of behavior, cognition, and emotion that imply inflexibility, which limits the acquisition of new behaviors and difficulties to handle stressful situations besides promoting vicious circles of functioning. Basically, it is a learned and maladaptive response proportionate to previous experience. And if your personality disorder is severe, your mental immune system is low. Now, an axis to personality disorder is classified as an enduring pattern of inner experience and behavior that deviates markedly from the expectations of the individual's culture. The pattern is manifested in two or more of the following areas. Number one, cognition, i.e. ways of perceiving and interpreting self, other people and events. Number two, affectivity, i.e. the range, intensity, liability and appropriateness of emotional response. Number three, interpersonal functioning, how we mix with each other. Number four, impulse control, how we stop ourselves from reacting and overreacting to stimuli. Now, there has since been a revised criteria of personality disorder, so let's look at that one too. So, A, significant impairments in self, identity or self-direction and interpersonal empathy or intimacy functioning. B, one or more pathological personality trait domains or trait facets. C, the impairments in personality functioning and the individual's personality trait expression are relatively stable across time and consistent across situations. D, the impairments in personality functioning and the individual's personality trait expression are not better understood as normative for the individual's development stage or socio-cultural environment. And E, the impairments in personality functioning and the individual's personality trait expression are not solely due to the direct physiological effects of a substance, e.g. drug abuse medication, or a general medical condition such as severe head trauma. So if we're going with Greta having a personality disorder, we're leaning more towards that than something biological such as schizophrenia. So let's look at the criteria for emotionally unstable personality disorder. The essential features of a personality disorder are impairments in personality, both self and interpersonal, and functioning and in the presence of pathological personality traits. So to diagnose emotionally unstable personality disorder, the following criteria must be met. Number one, impairments in self functioning, A or B. A, identity, markedly impoverished, poorly developed or unstable self-image, often associated with excessive self-criticism, chronic feelings of emptiness and dissociative states under stress. B, self-direction, instability in goals, aspirations, values or career plans. Number two, impairments in interpersonal functioning, A or B. So A, empathy, compromised ability to recognize the feelings and needs of others associated with interpersonal hypersensitivity, perceptions of others selectively biased towards negative attributes or vulnerabilities. B, intimacy, intense, unstable and conflicted close relationships marked by mistrust, neediness and anxious preoccupation with a real or imagined abandonment, close relationships are often viewed in extremes of idealization and devaluation and alternating between over-involvement and withdrawal. Now, let's come to the pathological personality traits in the following domains. So, number one, negative affectivity, characterized by a, emotional liability, unstable emotional experiences and frequent mood changes, emotions that are easily aroused, intense and or out of proportion to events and circumstances. B, anxiousness, intense feelings of nervousness, tenseness or panic, often in reaction to interpersonal stresses, worry about the negative effects of past unpleasant experiences and future negative possibilities, feeling fearful, apprehensive or threatened by uncertainty and fears of falling apart or losing control. C. Separation insecurity. Fears of rejection by and or separation from significant others associated with fears of excessive dependency and complete loss of autonomy. D. Depressivity. Frequent feelings of being down, miserable and or hopeless, difficulty recovering from such moods, pessimism about the future, pervasive shame, feeling of inferior self-worth, thoughts of suicide and suicidal behaviour. Then we come to disinhibition, which is characterised by impulsivity, acting on the spur of the moment in response to immediate stimuli and acting on a momentary basis without a plan or consideration of outcomes, 
difficulty establishing or following plans, a sense of urgency and self-harming behaviour under emotional distress. Risk taking, engagement in dangerous, risky and potentially self-damaging activities unnecessarily and without regard to consequences, lack of concern for one's limitations and denial of the reality of personal danger. Then we hit antagonism, characterised by a. Hostility. Persistent or frequent angry feelings, anger or irritability in response to minor slights and insults. The impairments in personality functioning and the individual's personality traits expression are relatively stable across time and consistent across all situations. C. The impairments in personality functioning and the individual's personality trait expression are not better understood as normative for the individual's developmental stage or socio-cultural environment. And finally, the impairments in personality functioning and the individual's personality trait expression are not solely due to the direct physiological effects of a substance, e.g. drug abuse medication, or a general medical condition such as severe head trauma. Woo! That was a bit of a whistle-stop tour for emotionally unstable personality disorder. But you get the idea of some of the things you need, the criteria, and how it's formed and how it interacts with the world in a very flawed and maladaptive way. For Greta, she had always demanded perfectionism and got wildly upset for no reason and lashed out by punishing her daughter. However, as with all emotionally unstable personalities, they attack and push away and hurt closest to them so they can perform the reparation ritual where they rebond with the loved one. So she torments her daughter and then, once time passes, becomes extra nice to avoid the abandonment and rebuild the bridges she has already burned. It's called reproachment and... Bearing in mind Greta's daughter had a boyfriend at the time she killed herself, the fear of losing her daughter was expressed by more wildly swinging moods and impossible expectations against a very childlike bridge burning when things went too far. In other words, her self-image and her actions were all about destroying only so she could rebuild it so mommy was best and mommy was the one she loved the most. However, emotionally unstable personalities are often raised in chaotic households and have abandonment issues from the age of early childhood, so Greta would more than likely have come from a childhood herself where she is now merely transferring her own experiences of perfectionism and abandonment onto her daughter. Now I'm going to do a video on emotionally unstable personality disorder in more depth at a later date, so I'm not going to go in depth too much here because I want to discuss something else that Greta has that I think is important and is comorbid with her personality disorder. I'm of course talking about delusional disorder. Greta more than likely has delusional disorder which is why she is kidnapping and torturing the girl she drugs. Now her abuse of Francis and the other children she drugs is congruent to the abuse of her daughter and also how her personality bonds to perceived threats of abandonment i.e. she hurts them and locks them in the box, but then it's cookies and cream and the real outcome of hurting them is to rebond with them via a very childlike mother-daughter moments where the child isn't a teenager, but a little baby girl. However, Greta convinces herself that these girls she abducts are her daughter. Now, Greta isn't some basket case or deeply psychotic individual unaware of what she is doing. Her traps are all done with high levels of executive functioning and takes skill, so she is aware of what she is doing and how to live quote, normally amongst society so everyone thinks she's an adorable widow rather than a psychotic, torturing child killer. However, her beliefs, once recreating scenes with her kidnapped young girls, are deeply congruent with severe delusional disorder because a delusion is an unshakable belief that something is untrue. Greta takes these young women and convinces herself that her daughter is still alive. She then treats them the same way, but once the delusion burns out and they reach the same point that Greta's daughter did when she killed herself, they are killed by Greta herself and then Greta goes to find another victim so she can keep replaying those moments of teenage years over and over again with childlike reproachment after severe levels of abuse and, although a false scenario, Greta is misinterpreting the whole experience. Delusional disorder is well known amongst stalkers. It's the kind of things where they'll say, she loves me, she just doesn't understand me, or he's my husband, he's just forgotten he's my husband and I'm going to remind him. And I myself have counselled people with severe delusional disorder and trying to even break through those thoughts are both dangerous and, at times, nigh on impossible. 
And when Francis has enough of Greta, it's then Greta who steps up her attempts at procuring Francis by following her around, stalking her, turning up at her work and becoming intrusive and antisocial. In other words, the rejection is a massive trigger for Greta to accelerate her aggression. Now, the stalking is mostly down to the delusion that she has found her new replacement daughter, but it's also her emotionally unstable belief that she is being pushed away and the abandonment is too much and, even if it's by threat, she doesn't want to be left alone and needs reproachment again with the object of her fixation. Basically, the delusional disorder and the personality disorder are comorbid. Delusional disorder is caused by biological, genetic and social factors and we are back into our multi-axial model. Yet for Greta, is it a lifetime of childhood trauma which has caused a personality disorder? Is it a brain defect? Or was Greta so upset and lost in grief that she cannot accept what her daughter did and if she acknowledges blame for just one nanosecond, then her entire psychological makeup would collapse. Therefore, is the delusional disorder a type of defence mechanism or is her self-esteem and ego identity compensating? It's more than likely that this isn't down to her ego or self-esteem alone, as Greta is cold-blooded and cruel and even kills young women once they reach the inevitable stage of needing to be replaced. Yet the need to replace kidnapped girls is also interesting because it shows the limits of the delusional disorder and the need to reignite the process again. Let me explain. Each kidnapped daughter passes through a very specific pattern. Firstly, they return the lost handbag, which means they are kind, honest and fit the criteria. In other words, they are verified as suitable. Then Greta bonds with them and goes through the first stage of reproachment, even though the girl doesn't know who Greta is, as she is starting that cycle of bonding with her daughter. Then Greta goes too far, pushes them away, as all emotionally unstable push people away all the time, forcing her to go into full kidnap mode. Now, remember, Greta loved her daughter through control, abuse, hurt and reproachment, and this cycle is now destined to repeat time and time again. Greta then reaches a point where, after multiple attempts to make them identical to her daughter, repeating experiences and so forth, she realises this isn't going to work and the attachment and abandonment cycle burns out. Finally, Greta kills them and then leaves a bag so she can repeat this cycle all over again. Greta is in love with the bonding and repeating stages of pushing and reproachment, not really wanting a long-term replacement, just that cycle and loop over and over again. However, Greta's delusions of grandeur and jealousy, mixed with her Machiavellian schemes to lure young girls to her home, means she is ruthless and she is always caught between comprehension, delusion, realisation and denial. And these four things are constantly bouncing around her head like an unstable nuclear reactor. So at the very end, Greta either needs to be sectioned in hospital or just killed as she's always going to keep doing this. The multi-axial model is a great way to look at illnesses in more depth and get more nuance and understanding. And remember, Greta might be a monster, but she was more than likely made this way through years of experiences which malformed her from adaptive child to an abusive mother. And I'm not excusing Greta's cruelty, I'm just trying to understand it. Which diagnosis she has, how evil she is, I leave that up to you. Anyway, that's it for this week's video. Remember, psychology is cool, so please like, share and subscribe and even leave a comment or a suggestion for a future video, as this one was actually requested by someone a few weeks ago. And until next time, I'll catch you later. Why put everyone through this again?